Da 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 da. What does Ron Burgundy do? He's like unique New York, unique New York. How now, brown cow? Okay. How now, brown cow? Let's start with vocal exercises. Yeah, we could, or we can just start with introductions. Should yeah. I just throw this out of the frame? Bye, bye, bye. Oh, Zelda. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's your podcast, so obviously you should probably do it. Yeah. Oh shit! What's the name of my podcast? Um, Harrison's Cast. Um, no. Oh, mag- Yeah, Harrison's Magic Cast, right? Because you like magic and stuff. Dude, it's not a Magic the Gathering team podcast. No, all right. Apparently, it's called the Lads Cast. Oh, the Lads Cast. Okay, so I have like so, already some aversion to this. The Lads I'm going cast. straight into it. All right, this is the <laughs> inaugural Lads Cast. Lads Cast double zero one, right? Yeah. Hoping that we get to triple digits. Being held at Mount Ebisu Productions. The very first time we're using the studio. Yeah, grateful to be here. Thank you, thank you for setting this place up. Actually, it did come out really well. Um, I'm very surprised that it came through. (laughs) Yeah, it took longer than expected, but thanks to your constant pestering, I finally (laughs) put the studio together so I could interview you. I needed I needed so. to do this podcast. I needed to. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You have a lot of uh, a lot of fascinating views about society. Yeah, so. I mean, hopefully we don't talk about them too quickly because, like, uh, probably we'll need to edit most of that stuff out. Anyway. Yeah, ninety percent is just gonna be like, no, nope, public can't handle this. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have a uh, my new, I think my view. I'm a pretty central person. Central, pretty, central. Cent- pretty, okay. pretty centrist. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's do the introduction. So this is the Ladcast Double Zero One. Yeah. This is your host Harrison, Harrison Ford. Is that um, your name? Yeah, you call me Harry Boy. Harry Boy. Okay, yeah, yeah. Harry Boy. Too so much for station. professionalism, right? <laughs> no puppy animals. No puppy animals. This needs to be a professional space. My name is Harry Boy, and this is the Ladcast. <laughs> yeah. So. Well. Yes, well, uh, thank you. Thank you for letting me introduce you. And yeah, I guess I'll introduce myself. My name is Sanath. Uh, I run a company called Gadget Software, and we do automation services for businesses. So if you do a lot of tedious tasks, or one of your employees does a lot of tedious tasks, or more recently, if you want to make use of the AI revolution for automating various things at your company, I'd be happy to help with that. Uh, You can just, I guess, reach out in the descriptions below. And uh, yeah, we can go from there. But Otherwise, yeah, this is your podcast, so... Yeah, but awesome. I actually didn't know that about you. I've known you for three years, and you finally introduced yourself. So, <laughs> um, I didn't know cool. your name. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know any of these things about you. It's great. Or what you do with your spare time or anything like that. Oh. Yeah. You know, I mostly just uh, try to harass you to play Resident Evil 4 with your PC, because you actually can't play it with a Mac uh, for the audience that doesn't know, but... Yeah, I do other stuff too besides just pestering you constantly to finish projects so that way I can take advantage of it. Well, um, it turned out successful this time. So. Yeah, no, it's good. Like this podcast, you guys can't see, but actually like it's set up so well that it's like super easy to to start doing this stuff. Like we don't have anybody else here. Um, it's yeah. just me and Harry Boy. So, so that's why it's special. This is the first interview because we're gonna be rolling these out. So yeah, who else? I'm just curious who's gonna be the next guest after this one. Um, maybe one of the quintessential lads. Oh, uh, okay, to kick gotcha. off the lads casts. Um, gotcha. So they can build their brand, I suppose. Yeah, build the lads brand, you know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, brand no one asked for. Okay. I'm gonna get canceled so fast for this. Yeah. <laughs> canceled. <laughs> No. Yeah, we yeah we don't cancel. We're actually immune from cancellation because we live in Tokyo, which is isolated from the mob of the cancel horde. Yeah, so they say. So, I mean, it's only a matter of time. Yeah, they'll, right? they'll come for us at some point. At some point. Based <laughs> off what information we release in this podcast, they'll make their way to Tokyo. Cool. Yeah. So, what's the first? I, we have like a list of topics, mm-hmm. obviously, that we want to talk about today. So, mm-hmm. like, what's the first thing that you want to talk about? Um. So, uh, first thing I want to know is. Since you are highly educated in a non-traditional manner, I want to know what are some of the most important things that you learned and you wish you learned earlier. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, actually. So this is funny because Harry Boy always makes fun of me for being like the most overly coached person in the world. (laughs) Really coached. It's kind of true. It is kind of true to a certain extent. Um, I do invest a lot in coaching services and also kind of like more bleeding edge education, like stuff like... For example, business education related to marketing and sales. 
there's kind of that moves too fast for I think the academic system to kind of keep up with. So if you want to learn how to run a business or like in a way where you actually make money and it's not this like hair pulling, horrible experience where you have no idea what's going on and then you just like cry yourself to sleep because you have staff to pay and you don't know how to pay them. Um, I think getting an education in these things is extremely important. Um, but yeah, I think primarily there's two things that are not taught by the education system as is that should be taught, which is uh, primarily government and how you interact with the government, what the government is beyond kind of just the basics, like retail level. Oh, these are the three branches. This is the constitution. But also like how that stuff is implemented and how it works in the daily life cycle of a citizen uh, doing stuff in the world, like getting taxed, paying taxes, uh, all that kind of stuff. Developments kind of like in the region uh, that a citizen might have a voting say in are generally not really that easy to get access to, even though it's really easy to hear random stuff in the media any day of the week. So that's one set of things. And then I think the other set of things, which I had alluded to before, is primarily like a business education and an education about the history of money, what it is, how the government controls it, how it's taxed, what inflation is, its historical roots. And that gives you kind of an overall context of like, you know, like probably the forces that are most structurally controlling an individual's life. Um, so those are the two things that I think are most important. But I get in education a lot of other things that I think are very interesting because probably the third domain that I don't think is taught very well but is very important is um, what it is to be like a human being, right? Like you have a body and a mind. Like what are some of the things that actually are high leverage within those systems that can kind of help you engage more easily in the world, have more energy, recognize when other kind of things like other businesses are using tactics uh, that prey upon your human psychology uh, in order to get you to buy products or services that you may not need. Uh, that thing, I think, is also kind of a dom domain that's very important and easy to ignore too, right? Because the other two are so, they're much more like objective, they're easy, they kind of have nothing to do with you in a way. But then once you start getting into the psychology aspect and then also like your own body-mind system and the triggers and all of that, that is an important part of the other two because they use all of those triggers in many different ways that most people are unaware of. Um, but also it gets a bit more personal, right? It's like, oh, like I'm that person. I behave like that. You know, it's like kind of gross and weird and feels strange, right? And mucky and icky, icky you, sticky. Yeah, but you definitely make a good point about strategies that like marketing um, marketers use to capture your attention. And things that people are just unconscious about, because, like, if you're, like, a good person who has an optimistic outlook, you don't necessarily realize that no one else is really looking out for you, especially anyone with a monetary interest to uh, use, basically to use you for money. As, like, a battery, right? Yeah, essentially. Like, um, if you're receiving information from them, you cannot take it at face value. It's something I feel like most people, oh, they learn through experience because they get taken advantage of over and over again yeah right so why not just <laughs> teach people not to get taken advantage of at the very beginning from the get-go right yeah it's a good question to ask right and like yeah. i mean the, once you start asking that question you're like try to get some answers it's not necessarily the nicest kind of answers that you're gonna get right most of it is just yeah. like yeah there's probably like a group of people that are better off than you and they can exist in many different strata of the economic sphere and pretty much all of them do not care about you as an individual at all, right? They're thinking about you in terms of like the bare bone metrics, which is like, how much money can I make from this person? How much are they willing to let me get away with? Yeah. Which is absolutely insane. Like, especially if you are kind of a blue collar, or white collar, kind of like, yeah, traditional positive outlook on life, um, kind of believe in like family or tradition or like all these loyalty, honor, kind of these... Uh, these things that are almost regalvanized by people who don't care about you to take advantage of you, right? So, yeah, I think I think learning about these structures from kind of a more non-traditional approach, because a lot of these people who have, say, in upper echelons of our society in terms of what kind of systems other people go through, they're not going to want to tell you about those things for obvious reasons, right? If they really don't care about you as a human being that they want to help thrive, if they want to lessen competitions for themselves, just from like a kind of lizard brain perspective, like a competitive world perspective, they're not going to want to do any of those things because that puts you 
in a position where you can threaten, you know, their situation. So you can like, I'm a big believer in humanity. I think that humans are beautiful. Like I really believe in the human race and it's in its capability, its evolution, the possibilities of which it's capable of doing. I'll give you an example. I was just at, um, what is it? Team planets. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that before? Uh, was that the exhibit in Rapungi? Uh, it's not in Rapungi. I think it might have used to be in Rapungi, but actually mm -hmm. now it's um, it's closer to Sukiji uh, Market, mm -hmm. the Sukiji Market. So it's uh, it's basically this huge art installation with tons of Japanese artists got involved in, and it's like this amazing light show and like indoor rivers and ponds that you wade okay, through. Okay, yeah, I've seen that on people's stories. Like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, super common. Cool. I mean, it's very Instagrammable. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, very Instagram highly yeah. recommend it. Uh, a lot of foreigners just come to Tokyo for this experience, but like the the experience of awe that somebody mm -hmm. created that's that kind of scenario and that you can enjoy it and just like it's just it feels like so otherworldly, ultra dimensional, kind of like being in a forest with like really weirdly tall trees. But like I see that stuff and I get inspired because I'm like, oh, like if we can do this or if somebody is willing was like out of like the joy of their life wanted to create something like this for another human being. Like I believe in humanity as a result. So, um, but not, I would definitely say like, as I've gotten older, as I've gotten educated more on kind of like, why is it like it, like this situation that there are all these kind of oppressive forces that are just trying to take my energy and time and money. Um, yeah, you start to find out that probably there are a fair amount of people in the world that don't really have another human's best interests in mind. Um, Stephen Colbert is kind of like a person that comes to mind about this, Why? actually. Someone was telling me, so I don't know this for sure, so it's like kind of unverified. And I also think Stephen Colbert, like back in the day, great jokes, really fucking funny dude. Um, but apparently he like told his audience that he was like selling them out and he was like, oh, sorry, I have to like take care of my family <laughs> when he was like strongly campaigning for people to get um, injected with various substances, you know, for their benefit or whatever. So are we not allowed to mention that <laughs> substance by name? <laughs> I don't know. I'm scared this is going to get bad. I know that we have no audience now, but you know, no. it could be, you know. People might enjoy what you have to say, what I have to say. <laughs> yeah, but now I have something to say about said unverified substance. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, what do you have to say? No, it's just, it's just crazy how um, the uh, the views on it changed mm. from entire, like, essentially socially coerced um, idea that we all have to, you know, take said substance for the good of, of public and, like, it's verified don't question it mm. and anyone who raised questions was you know immediately like branded um like demonic a, <laughs> dem <laughs> it's probably demonic yeah look at the sameness yeah yeah need to be exercised yeah how dare you ask a question <laughs> you say you emanation of satan you demonic holding wielding person and the crazy thing is after all this time basically all the data is coming out showing that oh yeah these questions were valid and actually showed <laughs> that we shouldn't have been giving people these substances if you look at the data and interpret it properly it didn't actually have the intended effect on public health that it should have and um uh, but then, like, it's kind of just getting swept under the rug because all these people took a public stance. They staked kind of their reputation mm. on take the substance, right? People don't want to publicly change mm. a stance. That has. Typical politician thing, right? You want to be consistent about all things. So you double down. Mm. So I just feel like, you know, um, all these people who took this stance, they're not going to backtrack publicly. It's kind of just going to get swept under the rug until we just forget about it all of this yeah yeah it's like people don't want to just be like i was wrong yeah um, it's gonna be weird i mean if there is kind of like a mass exodus where people are like yeah i was wrong about some of the things mm -hmm. that i said in the politician sphere or whatever it's gonna be a weird time to be alive right like we've almost never seen something like that it's probably never gonna yeah. happen but it would be cool but i mean my stance is personally like i welcome anyone changing their opinion based off evidence wow. like if someone was wrong in the past i would not shame them whatsoever if they came out and said that that's going to be applauded uh, okay. otherwise no one will ever admit their mistakes if yes. you shame them upon the admitting of their mistake right so um, yeah this goes to a personal situation with harry boy and me where i like vowed to never come back to his house and now i'm here so hey <laughs> <laughs> And 
I, I applaud <laughs> you coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, it's my values. I can't come back here again. And now I'm here. Yeah. Know, it's like, yeah, you tried to sell myself <laughs> a loophole. You're like, well, I vowed never to come back to that house. But if you move, yeah, I'm yeah, coming yeah, over yeah, to yeah, see yeah, you. Yeah. But then you just say, you know, now I'm here. Now so you're here. Yeah, it's too late, yeah, anyways. Yeah. <laughs> I might as well just give up the ghost, huh? You know, I'm again. just a, a man who was willing to sell out my own values for podcast representation, <laughs> a platform. <laughs> Well, at least you're honest with the public. That's yeah, why yeah. I, I want to well, say. Yeah, yeah. You, know, yeah, yeah. You, you change your mind about things. We came to you know, an understanding, I suppose, or you know, whatever. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But yeah, so this is kind of like the basis, I think, of this original podcast. Probably it's something that you guys are going to go over it with a lot of the other people that end up on this show. Yeah. It's like, yeah, this is like not necessarily a surface level discussion about how everything is good or how we agree with each other. But really, this is more just this discussion about, like, yeah, the world's kind of screwed up, and, like, what do you do about it, you know? Yeah, I, th I think currently there's this paradigm shift in people's perspectives of really questioning, right, these controlling forces, like, so socially and politically, mm. and, like, wondering if they've just been lied to all along and what mm. the real truth is. And then, definitely, the, the podcast format is really getting people to think about all this stuff, mm. and that's, that's really, like, my motivation to also engage in, in podcasts. Well, it's cool that you can have a discussion yeah. with somebody who might not necessarily have the same uh, standpoint as you. Actually, you're one of the only people that I feel like that actually reads books that distinctly go against kind of the narrative that you're currently on in your life, right? So you'll be like, this is something that I'm doing right now, but like maybe let's go check out what other people's perspectives are on this Dude, thing. It's so important before you commit yourself to an idea, you gotta be like, well, let me see if someone debunked that first. Yeah. Because so many times it happens, oh shit, that, that idea was wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, wait, it has all these holes and, and stuff. You're like, Especially when you feel like you're committed to it on some kind of spiritual level or something. It's not, you can tell it's not totally intellectual. Yeah. Be sure to question yourself and like yeah. read the other perspective. Yeah, right? well, it's so. rarely a spiritual thing. It's more like, just like a belief, like, oh, you gotta, yeah, like, I to do, oh. When you feel yourself <laughs> doing that for an idea, never sip for an idea, okay? Um. Face Don't reality. Sin. Yeah, never First sin. First of all, never sin. Actually. Never sin. Golden not, rule. Not for a belief. Yeah. Not for, you know, a significant other. Yeah. yeah never never simp, sin ever. Sin. Yeah, I guess that's kind of the golden it's rule. It's the golden rule of, of the lads. Never never so. simp on a thought about, yeah. like, what you're going to eat for lunch. Just don't simp ever, you know. It's like all layers of simping. Just yeah, we'll, we'll break those down over time. <laughs> like, well, people need to know. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So, yeah, what's the next topic that we can get into? Uh, Zelda, the new Zelda came out. There's, you know, we had a plush before that I just really yeah, threw you violently discarded it into the corner. Oh, so, so let's yeah. let's talk about why we can even have this conversation at all. So there's probably like two things that we can talk about, mm -hmm. right? One is isolation, living in the East, that kind of gives us the opportunity to like really get multiple perspectives on things, right? I think that's the main thing. Yeah. And also the second thing is critical thinking, right? And like how. Uh, Critical thinking, it's relation to the path of mastery. So it's like many people who you see who get good at anything or like are actually actively working on a skill set, you'll find them asking questions more often than people who don't have that sort of mentality. So that's another topic mm -hmm. that we can cover as well and why it's important to kind of like, you know, why this, why we're even talking at all. So, um, yeah, let's talk about living in Japan. <laughs> yeah, well, it's crazy because um, so we're essentially foreigners living in Japan. And on one hand, we have our own like community of Westerners that kind of um, have escaped the prevailing thought patterns that are plaguing the West at this current moment. We've kind of banded together mm -hmm. because we are critical thinkers. Mm. And uh, but it's, it's not that many people, right? Like, I no, it's only it's even within that. the Japanosphere yeah. of like the Gaijin or the people that are foreigners no um there's a very i think like kind of like a small subset of people that are like more kind of like iconoclastic they want to think about things in totally radical ways or um kind of have like that extreme artist mentality i think part of it comes from the fact that if you live in japan as a foreigner you're like never going to be part of japanese society so you like at a certain point you just stop trying and you recognize like oh this gives me the space to kind of behave you know, obviously within certain social bounds, but like behave or create in ways that 
I wouldn't normally be able to kind of if I was just in a community of people that understood me, um, etc. So I think there's a lot more space in Japan, definitely. And I also think like the people that end up being they decide that decide to live here for longer because they enjoy that space. They allow it to kind of manifest into kind of more interesting ways of perceiving things or constructing things for themselves or lifestyle design. Um, so I think that plays a huge role in it. What, what do you think? Um, you definitely have to embrace the pros and cons of being an outsider. Yeah. And I, I do think the pros far away the, the cons. The con essentially being that you can never actually fit into Japanese society mm. as a Japanese person. Regardless. But you can kind of do it a little bit, right? Like, I mean, if anyone could, I'm, I'm getting yeah, there. Right. because <laughs> I, I mean, just through language fluency and amount of time spent assimilating the culture mentally. Um, but it's... Um, no, there's, there's a ceiling, right? The, the gaijin ceiling. ceiling. And there in case you don't, ceiling. gaijin means foreign person living in Japan. In yeah. Someone has no knowledge of that word at all. So. But we refer to it endearingly. Yeah, so exactly. Kokujin is like the normal. But like if you're really being straight with people, you meet a bunch of old Japanese people, they're like gaijin-san, gaijin, gaijin-san. Yeah, gaijin. I don't know. It, it could have racist connotations. I've asked Japanese people sometimes like, oh, no, they are like they don't even yeah, think about it. It's so. not even that big of a deal. Really. Yeah. But there is definitely a ceiling. And at a certain point, you're kind of like, I mean, it's the ceiling with anything in the media, but you're kind of like dancing, you know, you're like, mm -hmm. I have a specific role to play within kind of Japanese media or ja just like Japanese society in general, right? Like you are the outsider and that's valuable too, because you offer the ability for a different perspective, but it's also like butt of the joke kind of thing, right? So it's like, oh, this guy is like really funny because he doesn't really get us so it's like he says things that are off the wall and then we have to like yeah pat him down or something it's like a that. balance because you don't always want to be the butt of the no, joke definitely. right but sometimes so. it's actually sometimes super good. It's, hilarious. it's so good sometimes it's so fun yeah. to play that role and yeah. you're just like everybody knows that that's yeah. what it is and it's like totally fine but if, yeah you know of course it's like not fun to be the the monkey of the group or something like that or the goofball of the group yeah. or something like that right and yeah, definitely like um, Japanese people's attitudes towards us, it ranges from like um, harmless, but like well-intentioned or like to just outright negative. There's mm. quite, quite a range. Yeah, right? super range. Um, There's a lot of different people that live in Japan too, right? Like super diverse. Like you, people talk about Japan as a homogenous society, maybe with some basic traits of the Japanese people and cultural nuance. But like super diverse in terms of perspectives, focuses, like uh, what people actually care about, subcultures, um, different styles, like styles of subcultures and styles of group dynamics. It's like, you know, it can get super, super different. So it's very easy to look at it from the outside and just be like, oh, Japan, Japanese people. But, you know. Once you get past that, it can... Yeah, be... subcultures are a big thing. Like, Japanese people, especially, like, younger, and people will definitely attach themselves to some subculture, which will go along with, like, fashion choice and music choice yeah. and, like, way of, way of Values. life. Values. Um, yeah, I think the, sub, the idea of subculture is much stronger in Japan than mm -hmm. other places because otherwise... Because a lot of people, especially, they don't feel like they fit into the mainstream, like... Um, say, shikaiji and, like, normal way of Japanese life, and mm. they prefer to attach themselves with subculture as a big meaning for them, mm. right? Um, and, yeah, because Japan is such a strong um, culture that requires, like, a large element of conforming, I mean, people are inherently diverse. So some, I will always hear, like, from some girl, like, um, you know, I always felt like you didn't fit in, right? And so, mm. like, that's why I thought I wanted to learn English, because I knew, like, you know, it might help me fit in abroad or somewhere yeah. like that. You Little that lot, they know. So. Little did they know. Oh, they know what they were up against. <laughs> okay. but, um, <laughs> but, yeah, not everyone learns English. Some people do, like, some gothic subculture or something or, like, uh, you know, attach really themselves into to dance. Really dance, like, nightlife or, like, something. So Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's, uh, but you just start to get a sense, I think, after you live here that there are a variety of different people. And, of course, you can make, like, definitely really good Japanese friends, too. But I think overall, yeah, there's just this distance that I think mm. exists, which is a, a, a huge relief, honestly, for me at least. And probably for our, like the vast majority of people who do kind of um, end up with like very nuanced perspectives on life, government, international politics or whatever. Uh, 
yeah, I think that they tend to enjoy that space too. And, and as a result, really enjoy living in Japan. Um, yeah, it's rare, right? Like if you're living back at home, you have your friends and they kind of have these expectations and they force you into some sort of box. And that can be cool. Like playing, you play a role for your friends too. But I think ultimately um, the, pe the people that enjoy living here the most really, really enjoy kind of like that feeling of freedom and kind of uh, self self authorship, I would say. Yeah, um, if I could distill like the core benefit of being a gaijin and living in Japan is that because of Japanese like that this strong conforming culture and all these societal rules, it actually works, society works very, very nicely because all the Japanese people, well essentially, like they obey these rules, they respect these rules, mm. create a great society. But as a gaijin, we're lifted from the expectations of mm. having to engaged in these rules whether whether we do do or not we're just not expected to and there's mm. actually a lot of pressure for japanese people it is a to lot uphold of all, the, all these rules like which we just don't have that pressure so we can kind of create our own lives mm. and still enjoy the benefits of this wonderful society yeah for sure which is i, I think that's like the huge advantage of being gaijin yeah in tokyo yeah for sure for sure i mean of course like you don't want to be like swiping your gaijin card at whatever return style that you can get um, you want to be respectful of Japanese rules, yeah. but you don't like necessarily need to fulfill them all the time or anything like that. You know, especially if you just hit the basics, like pay for the turnstile and not like yeah. rush through the train or like behave really strangely and try to like interact and um, be relatively within the scope of normalcy that other people can kind of be like, oh, this is a person and they're talking to me and they're well behaved or like not trying to like acting all crazy and making me feel scared. I think, like, you can definitely derive a lot of benefit of what you're talking about where, yeah, the rules are there if you need yeah. them, but then you can step out of them if you need to as well uh, as, you know, to your own benefit. Yeah, yeah. And especially being here for a while, you do feel like the, I don't know, the pressure, not so much the pressure, but, like, it just comes like a habit to engage in the rules properly. Yeah. But, but then you always know you have that gaijin smash option available. <laughs> <laughs> to, to get out of any situation so yeah yeah for sure for sure yeah if you ever need help you just say oh sorry i'm a foreigner i don't understand <laughs> yeah right yeah so now now you know now you know yeah. if you ever want to come here if you can enjoy kind of being like on the fringe outskirts of a society and be comfortable with that uh yeah. be comfortable with not making too many close friends but having close friends for sure um yeah, Japan can be a really good option for sure. But that brings me kind of to like, so what do you do with all the space, right? That's kind of like the question. And I think that brings mm -hmm. us kind of to the critical thinking discussion where I think what Japan has offered me is a really nuanced look into what it means to create art, the path to mastery, uh, and like how that segues into critical thinking, right? So, um, you know, for me in particular, especially with like all of the things that I create, whether it's on the business side with gadget software, or maybe I'm just like working on a very specific skill set. Like uh, what's interesting is how do you get better at something, right? And especially if you're working on the bleeding edge of something, like you're in martial arts and you're like looking at the meta level in competition, you know this from playing magic, right? And sure. in, in high level competition, there's always a meta game. So yeah. it's like maybe a set of techniques or kind of like uh, systems that compete against each other. And the way that a new kind of uh, person comes in and wins is they break the meta. They find a system that actually completely uh, removes all of the current systems at play uh, and kind of like makes them, uh, inoculates them in a way, right? So similarly, like that's how all kind of like high level competition tends to work in martial arts and competitive card games like Magic or Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, so if you're working at the bleeding edge like that, you can't necessarily just be like work, like working through a structured system, right? You have, that might be part of your education early on in your career. If you're making like music or you're making art, like drawing or painting or something like that. But eventually you kind of have to develop a taste. Like what is really good? Like, what does it look like? How does it feel? How does it make you feel? Why is it good? And you start asking that question why, right? so that's one aspect is developing really good taste. And then the other aspect is uh, iterating and getting feedback on the things that you're creating related to that thing and slowly working yourself up to something of a very high taste value, right? Of a very high subjective kind of, oh, this is awesome. And um, asking that question why brings you into critical thinking. You can't avoid it. 
this is the this is the issue right with a highly trained society and kind of like we're at where why we're at a cusp in the western world and pretty much everywhere else is that you can't just create a society of drone workers needing to operate on problems that require high levels of critical thinking as soon as and as soon as you start teaching people critical thinking in order to solve those problems they start asking other questions automatically they start asking <laughs> yeah. like oh why is this like this oh wait why is this being taken out of my paycheck oh why is this getting more expensive oh why is this like this uh, in my job why does my boss treat me like this why does my uh, other friend seem to be getting a better deal even though his skills are worse than mine and you start to once you start asking this question, you start to get weird answers that you're not expecting um, because you were trained by a system that didn't really bring in those concepts originally to what you're working on, right? So like as you might work on a skill set, uh, maybe you're working on podcasting or public speaking or you're working on um, you know, a variety of other skills like playing video games. Maybe you're trying to like do the speed run of the year for Resident Evil 4. Mad shout out, that game looks great. Want to play at your house one day. Not the old one, the new one. Uh, you start to understand like other things about life that start to bother you, you know? Because mm. the reason why you're even asking why about that original thing is it bothers you. You don't understand why that thing is good, but it makes you feel a certain way or you have some subjective feeling that this is great. And the fact that you can't reproduce it like is an incessant problem, an intractable, intractable problem that you continuously try to solve. And slowly you get there, and then slowly you realize that that same process starts to exist for pretty much everything else, right? It's like, okay, why is this political system good? Like, what about it? Can we break that apart and see? And you actually do get answers. You have to be willing to ask that question why, and answers will eventually come. But you just got to be patient. Yeah. And I think um, an underlying theme might just be embracing like discomfort. And like if you're learning something new, right, like you can't just once you've mastered um, one step, you have to look for your zone of proximal development, the part where like you're kind of uncomfortable working on something, but it can still lead to results. Um, and people and the way to get that is as you're describing a kind of feedback iterative loop of where do I um you know, attack next mm -hmm. to, uh, to improve. And yeah, I, that's kind of separates people who become really great at stuff and, you know, kind of other people who stagnate. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple of things that go into that. One is like, I look at stuff that I'm working on now that I was working on like two years ago and I see it completely differently because I've continued to take action in that area. I continue to kind of like get good discernment of what my peers are doing as well and seeing like what's making them successful versus not successful and like you got to treat it as kind of a really long-term process you know if it's something valuable to, of course like there are certain things that you can learn in like three days but if there's something valuable like a career that you have that's going to be a lifelong career that you're working mm -hmm. with data science or software engineering or whatever you got to really treat it like oh, i'm going to work on this for like 20 years and so if I'm going to work on this for 20 years and this is what I really care about, uh, I'm not going to regret spending that time. Why don't I work on the stuff that I suck at and not care about the results until later or allow the results to just come of their own accord, right? Because if you're really working on kind of that process of like, okay, I need to create something and I need to focus on this. This is the area of incompetence that I have. How can I get advice on this? Can I try experiments? Can I implement kind of things that I've heard from other people that worked and see how it comes together. You just do that continuously for 10 or 15 years or something. How you can't not get good. Right, right. And I think this is most relevant to something like with an unclear path to mastery. Like, I'm sure it's relevant. Like if you want to become a master of guitar, I mean, I think it's kind of like people know how to do this by now. But like mm. for you, like I think you're talking about more of like, I mean, you built your business, right? right? So anyone building any business is unclear of how you create a successful step, business, right? right? So it requires a lot more of this critical thinking, iterative process. Mm. Yeah, do you want to talk more like your own example? <laughs> I mean, like, maybe a little more specific to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. I think, I think social skills and like learning how to be better at interacting with other people is like a good example of that because it's like extremely personal and there's so much that goes into that. Um, I think working on a business is a really good example. 
I'm trying to think of like technical things, like working on software and learning how to get good at software. It's interesting, right? I just like read a lot of books. I, I did a bunch of projects while I was reading these books. Mm. I tried things out when I was reading these books and I watched as my skills jumped considerably each time I did an experiment. So it's like, it's not like this weird mystical thing where I got better. I can actually track back to like, oh, I like read this excerpt from this book. I took this very idea. I implemented it in the actions that I was taking and I got a better result. And it's similar like in, in sales or marketing, right? You split test things, right? You like try running a Facebook ad. Yeah. You see how it works. Maybe you screw it up. I mean, we did that today with the with with Gadget Master Harry Boy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trying to figure like, out the studio. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're like, all right, where are the deficiencies, and how do we plug them, basically, until eventually we end up with what we were doing right now, right? So, like, um, yeah, there's a lot of different examples uh, I can come up with for my own life, but I really do think like experimentation, finding mentors, like getting advice from people that are better than you, like getting feedback, like really getting feedback and like listening mm. honestly and allowing it to land and then taking that feedback, parsing out the gold and then implementing it in kind of a next action step is very important, especially for people who are better than you at the thing that you're doing. Uh, I did it with guitar, but I do think actually what you're talking about applies to anything, including arts that seem to be well-defined. Mm. And the reason why is because um, at a Different people, ha everybody has like a different body mind, right? Mm. And different systems work better for different people depending on their own personal deficiencies. So I'll give you an example. Like, um, I think for me in general, just like learning how to be a bit more kind of uh, um, a little more, a bit more bold in general. So, with everything that I do in terms of like putting myself out there, taking a risk, making an ask has been kind of a deficiency for me, like periodically throughout my life. So systems that emphasize a bit more of being bold and taking risk tend to work better for me. They tend to work better for me. They tend to end up surfacing more knowledge that I can learn through my own experience. Um, meditation is a really good example because it's like such a subjective thing, but you learn, you can learn so much about how your mind, personal mind works and also like kind of like the strata of experience, I think. Um, from like working on trying different kind of meditation systems, seeing which practices kind of resonate with you, doubling and tripling down when you see something really working and like being unafraid of really going down that path. Um, getting advice from other people, talking about your experience with other people as well. I remember J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, like that whole group of fantasy writers, they mm -hmm. all met with each other, right? So that's the one weird thing that I think is not really commonly discussed. We see somebody at the epitome of their success ladder and they're like, wow, they did it by themselves. And you're like, you're looking at a person like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk and you're not recognizing the massive teams that they built under them. This huge trust network of investors, of people that, technical people that work for them, people that mentor them and help them kind of like see the bigger picture and stay aligned on their purpose, like uh, their friends and their family, like all of the people that work for them on a service capacity and take off all of that like uh, kind of cognitive load and cooking and cleaning and all this stuff. You don't recognize like this huge system that basically is under that person and put them in the position that they're in right now, right? So. Uh, and then on top of that, they're talking to the other best people in the world. It's like not an accident that uh, generally you find like these pockets of people that all get really good at the same time. It's because usually they're interacting with people that are working on the same skill at a very high level. They're talking about concepts and nuance on a completely different degree than anybody in isolation could ever do. So uh, maybe that clarifies kind of like your question about like specific things that I've worked on. Do you yeah. feel like you developed this mastermind group that helped you? Uh, With various things? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think I think good attracts good too, right? Like, mm -hmm. So if you're out there and you're doing stuff that you really enjoy um, and you're like really actively trying to get good, like your intention is I want to get good at this. This is the getting real results is the most important thing. I think that really attracts something that brings. So there are a couple of it. I did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for seven years. Um, and I haven't done it recently, mm. mainly because the coronavirus stopped me from continuing to train. So I got interested in other things. But my original coach, his name was Riley Bodycomb. Shout out to Riley. I love you, man. I think that you're one of the greatest teachers I've ever had. And one of the first teachers that I've ever had as well, uh, who I consider like a real kind of mentor. A lot of the things that he says to me that 
they come back again and again. And I'm like, mm. oh, wow, that's like really good wisdom, uh, not just for martial arts, but for life. But like, I remember he used to teach in New Orleans and I remember going to one of his classes and uh, it's just the vibe was totally different, right? Like I would go to the Brazilian jiu-jitsu classes and they were all right. Like there were definitely people who were trying to compete or get better at gi jiu-jitsu or no gi jiu-jitsu. Mm. But in particular, his class was different. It was like so competition focused, really focused on kind of like what wins in competition, why does it win, distilling out all of the knowledge piece by piece in a way that's not like traditional, was not just taking from traditional martial arts. It took what worked, but it also added in kind of like all of these other nuanced understandings that he got mm-hmm. from watching, teaching, working on his own craft himself, coming up with solutions. And I mean, this is how anything is developed. All the martial arts were developed in this very way. Sambo mm-hmm. in particular was developed by prisoners fighting in the gulags. And then after they fought, like, oh, that worked better, obviously. Maybe, I, I don't know the exact story, but probably because somebody didn't die. You know, one of them, <laughs> one of them actually survived the fight. So you're really looking at kind of like a continual evolution of of learning, right? And systems. Mm. A lot of it is based on individuals and kind of like the context of where they're at. So like right now we live in Tokyo. These are the cultural nuances that are happening. These are the business nuances that are happening. This is what everybody has their eye on. They all have their eye on AI. So this is kind of the zeitgeist. And then the zeitgeist, from the zeitgeist, all of these new kind of ways of doing things and new knowledge emerges. Um, so it's a lot, it's very context dependent as well. And so as a result, we can't, We can always look back to history to help us understand what's happening now. But ultimately, it's up to us to come up with our own experiments and kind of see the world through our own eyes and make our own distinctions and understand the patterns that are happening in front of us. And I mean, this kind of like brings it full circle, right? Because I don't think we live in a society that allows us to do that. You know, it's like actually not cool for you to try to come up with your own ideas. And if you say something that's actually kind of like way ahead of its time because it's very uncomfortable and it's like you know people don't it doesn't it flies in the face of maybe what people want to hear well then you have a real problem on your hands right that's like cancel (laughs) yeah well i think regardless of society's attitudes at the time people always respect someone who will take action Mm. like if they like they have an idea or something say they have a controversial like business idea people are like oh that sucks they'll still respect you if you actually try yeah and it work, right? yeah it's kind of true right um uh, any like anything um and people when they see you like not asking for confirmation around you and just you just have that belief in yourself and take action mm. look you're like oh shit man like they kind of want to follow you it's yeah. kind of like leadership is generally just taking that first action yeah and people will just they'll recognize that like unspoken and kind of gravitate towards you as the leader yeah and i've just seen that in so many different walks of whoa life. Yeah. that's crazy yeah do you have some examples of that actually uh, the streets. Uh, so. the streets. <laughs> yeah, the streets. The streets. Yeah. yeah no, yeah. it's kind of real, right? And it's like, it's kind of weird. It builds on itself. And it's kind of, even if people can't articulate it, it's like kind of clear that that is what's but, happening. Yeah, I think generally in business, like, if you like, say I'm like on a strategy team, right? Like, um, if I come up with an idea and talk about it, people will like um, say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. This, But I feel like I already did this and I'm going to send the result mm. to like the head manager. They'll be like, Oh, yeah, okay, let's get behind that, yeah. actually. Right? Like, it's, it's from actually doing it, and then people, you know, will kind of just get in line. Yeah. Um, you just got to have the balls, I think, to kind of take action, or the cojones, or the kaluas, yeah. or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. But I do think taking action kind of, like, precedes everything else, because that's how you even learn, right? That's where the surprise comes from. You're like, oh, I did this thing, and, like, I didn't expect this to happen. Let me share this information with somebody yeah. else. And especially yeah. not knowing if it's going to work. And I think you, if you don't know it's going to work, you try to do it anyway. You'd be surprised how much you learn by trying to figure out how to make it work. Yeah. Rather than just being like, ah, it's probably not going to work. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Let's go play RE4. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Classic. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. That, and that's like the critical, dis, uh, critical thinking yeah. discussion yeah, in that. a nutshell, right? Yeah. For sure. So cool. I mean, we're already at like 45 minutes, I think. Crazy. Yeah, we're pretty close. So is there anything else that you want to go over before we kind of close out and maybe say our outro moments? Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> peace and love. Yeah, peace and love. You're, for all you out there, you know, we just want to let you know you're loved. 
Not by us, but by someone. All right. Hopefully. <laughs> Michael Sonoff Jackson. Michael Sonoff Jackson. Is that what he says? Yeah. Sounded like him. It sounded like his voice. Cool. So yeah, let's just do the outro. Yeah, what are, what outro. are uh, what can people expect kind of from like the next podcast and stuff? Anything you want to share? Um, Maybe you have a website that you can redirect people to or whatever. Yeah. So definitely. I mean, this is so inaugural. I don't even have like my YouTube channel and everything set up. So I'm gonna have to. Um, uh, put links in the bio, which doesn't exist yet. Yeah, yeah. So, no <laughs> so this is flagship. Um, but yeah, we really di- didn't even scratch the surface of uh, society, to be honest. Oh, uh, yeah, we didn't even really talk. Yeah, I think we were just crazy. talking about kind of the fundamental problems, but we can talk about the expression yeah. in society yeah. afterwards. I think this was this was a good reference, like personal development, especially like intellectual and psychological development. Great reference. But there's so much more to, to be discussed. I mean, bringing on some zany characters with their own ideas. Oh, man. It's going to be fun. And their own life experience. Yeah, it's a weird group of people, huh? Yeah. Definitely a very strange group of people. But yeah, it should be cool. Um, and yeah, my name is Sanath again. Uh, the links in the description to my business are going to be in, lo- in the description below. Right? Yeah. And um, yeah, Gadget Software, we do automation work. So if you need automation work for your business or AI chatbot stuff uh, or anything AI related because we've been doing tons of that stuff a gadget lately i'd be happy to help so feel free to reach out yeah and i'm harry boy this has been the lads cast and see you next time cool thanks for having me on man yeah it's been real nice to catch it let's see if i just click this button